Hi, I am Professor Milligan. Welcome to my weekly series, Wall Street Wednesdays. I record this series live every Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on my Instagram account, at Professor Milligan. Welcome to join me there. I'll listen to the recording here. Enjoy. Thanks. Well, here we are. Good afternoon. You're here with Professor Milligan. The market just closed. Market's up 527 points. So here I am today to talk about helping you guys put more money in your pocket. So um, before I get started with talking about the market per se and some other things and other areas, um, I just want to say, you know, just a moment here that, um, you know, we have a lot of civil unrest here. We've got um, a lot of violence in the street. We have protesting, which we should have protesting. Um, I don't, again, I, I, I'm not here to preach, but I did watch as George Floyd was basically murdered on the street and it brought up a whole bunch of emotions for me. So um, with that said, my goal here to, today, like always, is to help you guys put money in your pocket. So with a heavy heart, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to talk to you guys, start explaining some things to you, help you put some money in your pocket, knowing that um, going forward that there's a lot of things out there in the marketplace that are going to affect our investments and affect, affect what we're doing. All right, so with that said, market, set, market was up 500 some odd points today. I'm looking at it right now. Closed up 527, it looks like. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things. One, the stock market and the economy are not the same animal. They're two distinctly different animals. The stock market has an effect on the economy. The economy has an effect on the stock market. The stock market is said to be a forward-looking mechanism. In other words, it's a leading indicator. So investors, individual investors, but definitely portfolio managers, they are investing today based upon where they think the economy is going to be a year, two years from now. They are forward looking, six months to a year, forward looking. So when you see the market up 500 points today, it's not because of something that happened in the market today per se. It's more about what they perceive is going to happen going forward in the future. Now, with that said, there are several factors in our economy that look like we're leading, that are leading us and looks like we're headed towards not only a recession, but a depression. So based on the indicators we're getting in the economy, based on the indicators that was and what we're seeing in the market, we're headed in two separate directions. Now, with that said, you don't have to be an economist to make money in the market, nor do you need to be able to forecast the market to make money in the market. So let me explain what I mean by that. Forward-looking mechanism. All right. So we invest today based upon what we think is going to happen in the future. You invest today to sell that stock six months, a year from now at a much higher price. Even if you're short-term day trading, you invest right now because you believe at some point in the future, minutes or days, you can sell it for a higher price. So what am I here to say? Easy. You can make money in a bull market or a bear market. It does not matter. You can still make money in this marketplace. So with that said, how do you make money in this marketplace? So I'm going to go over a couple, a couple of things. All right. First and foremost, we are right in the middle of what they call earnings season. Earnings are when a corporation comes out, or excuse me, earnings season Four times a year, corporations must come out and they must, I repeat, must disclose their financials for the quarter that just ended on your quarterlies. And they'll give you, uh, um, they'll give you advice, they'll give you their forecast for the current quarter they're in. They'll also give you, in most cases, a forward forecast for the upcoming 12 months. So again, the quarter they just finished, the current quarter they're in, and then a yearly projection. At the end of the corporate year, which sometimes is the same as the calendar year, these same corporations will also give you what happened for the whole entire year. And they'll also give you some forecasts for the upcoming year as well. All right, so why is earnings season important to us? I call it money-making time. And that's because 
when you look at earnings per share, earnings per share is nothing more than what's left for the corporation after they pay all their expenses and all their bills. What's left for the common stockholder. Wall Street looks at earnings like real estate looks at location. So if you're buying real estate, you always hear them say location, location, location. All right. When it comes to stocks, earnings, earnings, earnings. So let me break down what's going on. Yesterday at the close, Zoom Technology reported earnings per share. All right. Wall Street was looking for it. Wall Street was expecting it. Wall Street had a forecast, I believe it was, at 10 cents per share. So what that meant for every share outstanding, corporation earned 10, 10 cents. Let me bring this down for you in terms of terms you understand. The top of the income statement is revenue. Look at revenue as your gross salary, your gross paycheck. Then out of revenues comes expenses. It comes cost of goods sold, take that out. Then we gotta take out expenses for running the business, rent, mortgage, salary, health benefits. All those expenses come out and brings us down to our operating income. From operating income, we take that money, we take that, and we pay our taxes, we pay our bondholders, we pay our preferred stockholders. We get down to net income. That's the bottom line. That's how much money the corporation made for the corporation, net of all expenses. Take the net income divided by the number of shares outstanding and gives you earnings per share. So going back to Zoom technology, Wall Street forecasted 10 cents a share in earnings. All right. Here's how this works. Had the earnings come in at 10 cents in line, most likely the stock would have sold off or maybe held. But again, it was what Wall Street was expecting. If the number came in less than 10 cents, Wall Street doesn't like surprises. That surprise, less than 10 cents, what Wall Street was expecting, stock would have probably went down and stayed down for a while. But in, in Zoom's case, they didn't report 10 cents a share. They actually doubled it. They reported 20 cents a share. With that 20 cents a share, they also reported a 169% increase in revenue for the year. So let me put that in simple terms. Imagine that you just got a raise on your gross salary of 169%. So you went from making 100 grand a year to making 169 grand a year in one year. Phenomenal growth. All right. With those growth numbers that they did, first and foremost, it, 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 it put the stock in a position where we realized that things are going really well for them. The next thing, though, is that they raised their forecast of earnings for this quarter and for the year. What that means is they expect to continue, continue to see their income go up. And they also continue, expect to continue to see their revenue go up. With that said, I'm, I'm looking for it now. I know that uh, Zoom ended up closing. I was up at 220 bucks a share. You know, up up 10 cents a share, 15, 15 to me, 10, 15, up 10% for the day. They also, at this point, several major Wall Street firms have come out and announced that they think the stock's on its way to 300, and they gave some price targets. Now, why am I telling you all this? This is simple. One of the things to look at is, again, earnings per share. They're giving us their forecast. If you want to own a growth stock that's going to go up in value, one of the things you want to look for is what kind of revenue growth are we seeing and what kind of earnings per share growth we're seeing. So with that said, um, Zoom has gone to an all-time high, 220 some odd dollars, and forecasted to go to 300 bucks. So if this market holds steady, this market holds up, and we don't have a correction, you can expect to see Zoom do that. Now, with all that said, I'm not telling you to buy Zoom. I'm telling you what Wall Street looked at, what Wall Street is looking at, and why Wall Street brought the stock and why Wall Street believes the stock will be significantly higher going forward in the future. Now, one of the things you always hear me talk about is you got to be forward looking. So forward looking, one, this pandemic, not sure when it's going to be over. Two, there's no question more and more employees are going to be working from home. They're not going to be working in the office. Corporate America has already said that. I believe it was either Google or Amazon said half their staff is now going to work from home. You're seeing this all over. The university is now teaching classes online. They're not going into the brick and mortar. So. Zoom, Ring, 
Citrix. These kind of companies are going to do well because of what's going, going to happen going forward. So again, remind you, you don't have to have a bull market to make money in a stock. The key is going to be is what are you looking for when you buy the stock? What's going on with the stock? So that's the earnings per share. One of the things I highly recommend is that when you find companies that you like, you're a growth investor, whether it's short term or long term, when you find companies that you like, one, find out when they do the report earnings. Two, find out what Wall Street is expecting them to announce for earnings. This is what Wall Street does. The analysts ride around, they go to the company, they talk to senior management, and they come up with an estimate based on that conversation and what they think the company's gonna earn. Now, again, for stock investors, earnings per share is like location, location, location for real estate. So when you see these earnings, monitor your stock the week before earnings, monitor your stock during earnings and the week after earnings. Now, why do I say this? My experience has been that in most cases when Wall Street expects the company to beat earnings, you'll see the stock trade higher before the earnings. Now, again, this is not an absolute. As I said to you, majority of the time. Two things I look for when I look at a company going into earnings. I look to see if, if it's at or close to its all-time high. And I also look to see what's happening with volume. All right. I like stocks that are near their all-time high on heavy volume ahead of earnings because what it tells you is that Wall Street is trying to load up on the stock ahead of the earnings and take advantage of these positive numbers that come out. Now, when you look at these earnings and you follow the and track the stock, what you'll also notice is that after the earnings come out, especially when they're really good, the stock might run a bit, might run 10, 15% from the old high or from where it was. But then expect a retracement. A retracement's nothing more than the stock price coming back down from the highs it set off of that news. That retracement is nothing more than profit taking. You have investors out there who are buying the stock ahead of the earnings. When they see the earnings and get the earnings, they get their money, stock pops, they sell it out, put the profit in their pocket and go on to the next company that's due to report earnings. All right. What I'm telling you is that pullback, that 50% pullback that you'll see is nothing more than a chance if you want to, to add to your position. But it's going to pull back. There's going to be profit taking. But then again, if you watch the stock over the quarter, if the market holds up, pull back, but then it should go and then take out the old high and continue to go higher. And that's because Wall Street analysts now are starting to follow, that are following the stock, are now up, uploading, upgrading their numbers, upgrading their the valuations, all because the company has better earnings. All right. Now, if your company misses earnings, if the company misses earnings, all right. Now, when I say miss, there's what Wall Street expects. If they miss earnings, you can expect the stock to probably sell off a little bit near term. If the earnings were still, they missed what Wall Street was expecting. All right. Follow me now. They missed what Wall Street was expecting, but they hit the number that they told everyone they were going to achieve. Your stock might sell off a little bit, will sell off a little bit, but once that fast money's out of the stock, it will continue to trade and probably go higher if it was already going higher. Now, if they just totally blow out and miss the number and miss the number that Wall Street was expecting, what Wall Street had forecasted for them, stock's in trouble. All right, stock's going down. And one of the rules that I've always used when it comes to growth stocks, you miss two quarters of earnings in a row, I'm done with you. If your earnings that were growing at double digits, 15, 20, 25%, stop that growth rate, then most likely I'm going to sell. This brings me full circle to what I've always said to you, and I'm going to say it again. The way you come up with a sell strategy is based upon why you brought the stock in the first place. If I brought the stock for the earnings, then if I get if I don't get the earnings I'm looking for, I'm going to sell the stock. It's just that simple. If I brought the stock for earnings and I get the earnings I'm expecting, or even better, 
and the stock looks like it's going higher, I'm going to hold off on selling it. I know it's going to pull back, might buy a little more, but I'm going to hold this thing. I'm going to give it time to really work now. All right. So that's what's going on with earnings. And again, this is a real brief. I'm going to, you know, real brief. If you have any questions, um, I'll, I'll get to those questions later on. But that's what goes on in earnings season. You'll hear on the financial channel, let's say we're in earnings season, big time earnings season. You'll hear me say it's money making time. That's what earnings does. Now, for my long-term investors, you still want to track the earnings. I want to track the earnings. Let's go back and, and look at it from another, uh, another, another, another angle. I hired you to come work for my company. You're in outside sales. You had a great quarter. Now, I'm still watching you. You could be one of my great salespeople, but I'm still watching you see, was that quarter a fluke or is that quarter consistent with what I can expect from you? And with the great companies that have tremendous growth potential, you'll notice that this that one quarter was not a fluke, that there were several quarters like that. And in fact, one of the things I do is I'll go back and look at earnings, historic earnings, and I'll look and see, did they meet the number? Did they beat the number? Did they surprise on the number to the upside or to the downside? I love companies that are surprising to the upside, which means business is actually better than what Wall Street was expecting. All right. So that was earnings per share. Now, let me check my time, you guys. You guys who've been in class with me know how I always am. I, I take a pause. I check my time. I uh, remind you guys that you can follow me also. Well, I'll do this right now. You can follow me also on, on um, God, I just had a senior moment. You can follow me on, on, on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, which is Professor Milligan. Uh, I will post this video up there. I'll also post other educational videos up on my YouTube channel. So make sure you follow and subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also, as you know, come every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, when, as soon as the market closes, I'll come on. I'll talk about the market. I'll talk about ways to make money, ways to make money in the market. Uh, I covered derivatives. So again, just, just follow me on that. All right. Now, one of the other things that I think we should talk about is I told you that the stock market and the economy are two distinctly different animals and that Wall Street analysts are the ones who are buying stocks for where they think they're going to be six months, a year, two years down the road. Wall Street portfolio, large portfolio managers typically aren't day trading. Um, they're taking down size because of the size that they take down. They cannot easily buy and sell the stock. It could take them literally several weeks to get in a stock and take them several weeks to get out. So because of that, when it comes to Wall Street, we want to look and see where they're putting their money. They hire all these economists, they hire all these analysts to figure out where we should go, where your money should be. And because of the size, they start positioning themselves today for movement six months, a year from now. I know I've said that several times, but here's the reason why. One of the things that I track, I look at on a weekly basis, is what we call money flow. And what I do is I track where money's going in the market in terms of what industries, what sector, and where money's flowing out of. If, if you're going to make money in the market, anybody, you have to actually buy the security. We can track that. We can track whether there's more money buying. If, if there's more buyers than sellers, that means money flows going in because there's money flowing in the stock. Or we can also tell if there's more sellers than buyers and money's flowing out of the stock. Is it possible for a stock to go higher as money flow comes out? The short answer is, yeah, it is. I've seen it happen. But one of the things I look at is I look at where money's flowing into. What industries are they flowing into and what industries are they flowing out of? I track that. I'm going to follow them. All right? Let me make sure we're clear on this. I'm going to follow them. The difference between them and me, though, is they're steering a Titanic, the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mary. I'm steering a cigarette boat. Let me explain the difference. If you're investing with a Titanic, it means, just so you know, they saw the iceberg. They saw how big it was. They saw what was going on. They saw it. But yet they still could not avoid hitting it. Why? 
because the ship they were steering was so big, they could not maneuver around it. That's a portfolio manager. A guy's managing, you know, if a guy's managing 500 million, a billion dollars in the stock market in the portfolio, or it's his team. Trust me on this. They cannot get in and out of a stock like you and I can. That's the reason why they're so forward looking. That's the reason why they have to do things that way because they cannot take advantage of, of speed and quickness. Now, you guys are on, on this call with me on, on, on Instagram Live. I don't care if your portfolio is $100 million. As far as Wall Street is concerned, you are mom and pop. We're the guys in the cigarette boat. We got in our little cigarette boat. We cruised up to the, the iceberg. We got out of the iceberg. We literally parked our little cigarette boat on the iceberg, got out, walked around, looked, got back into our cigarette boat, and drove off. That's you guys. You can take your portfolio to cash in probably 30 seconds. All right? You don't have to worry about where the market is going to go in six months or a year. You can actually stay in the market just before the crash or right during the crash and still get out and liquidate. Now, the reason why I say that is a number of investors, including myself, have missed this last bullish move that the market had, move that it had. And the reason why we missed it is because we were focused on the economy and not focused on the market. If you focus on your stocks in your market, knowing that you can get in and if things don't go well, you can get out like that. If, if it, it prevails you that opportunity. The second thing I'm going to say is when you understand this, you'll also understand that if you're going to go into the market, even with, and, and by the way, I love volatility. Anyone that's ever been in my class with me knows I always talk about, I love volatility. I go to it. I don't run from it. The reason why you run to volatility is Volatility can be volatility to the upside or volatility to the downside. So if you were long, I'll pick one. One of the fangs, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. If you were long any one of those, that volatility worked in your favor to the upside. The stock, Those stocks ran for you. Now, if you were short those stocks and the volatility kicked in, you lost a whole bunch of money. So in this environment, I'm going to say it again. One, you can go long stocks and trade this marketplace. You guys are in cigarette boats. You're not in the Titanic. Two, be nimble. What that means is it might not be a long-term hold. In other words, you might see a 5%, 10% profit short-term, and you might want to take that profit. If you plan on holding anything longer than that in this type of volatile market, and volatility is going to kick in, then use some type of hedging strategy. I'll talk about that on another call. Don't have time to go into all that now. But all I'm saying to you guys is we can still make money in this market. All right. Now, um, forward looking. Oh, before I forget, before I forget, I am a student of investing. I am a student of investing. I'm always looking for new methods. I'm always looking to improve the methods I use. Now, why did I bring it up to you guys? I've been at this for over 30 years, and I'm telling you, for 30 years, and I'm still a student. Actually, it's been more than 30 years. I'm closer to 40. Jeez. I guess showing my age. But again, I'm still a student. I'm learning every day. I'm researching. I'm studying. Always looking to get better. So, you guys are also students, all right? So as a student, you need to grow and you need to learn. I highly recommend you keep a journal. I'll say it again. I highly recommend you keep a journal. Write down every trade that, you, that you're doing as you do them. Write down why you did the, why you, why you put the trade on, what indicators, whatever it is that led you to make that trade, whether it's that you watch somebody on TV, your best buddy called you up, whatever it is, write down why you made the trade. After you write down why you made the trade, whenever you get out of that trade, whether it's a short-term day trade, whether it's you're in the stock for the next six months, 
Whenever you decide to sell the stock, write down why you sold it. And if you made money, why you made money. If you lost money, why you lost money. All right. You have to keep a journal. And then like all journals, go back and read it and figure out what you did right and figure out what you did wrong. If you don't know why you made money in the stock, how can you repeat the process? If you don't know why you lost money in the stock, you're doomed to repeat that process and keep losing money. And then the third one is, even the best investors are only right 60, 65, 70% of the time. Those are the great ones. So even you could do everything right and your strategy can still be 75% right and still lose money on that particular trade. But write down why you did it. This is a growing and learning process. Um, now, I, I, I got somebody that said this is kindergarten over here. It's not kindergarten over here. What this is, I've got some newer investors in here that are just learning how to invest in the market. And my goal is that everyone that's on this call, whether you're a beginner or whether you're a seasoned vet, that I can help you put more money in your pocket. Um, if you have a specific question because you feel like this is too elementary for you, Feel free, really feel free to hit me up with a question. And maybe I'll get to your question. I'm on, I'm on for an hour. I have no problem talking about more advanced topics. Now, with that also said, I said the journal, keep your journal. I have journals. Keep your journals. Read your journals. When I was your age, when I was much younger, living in Jersey City, working on the floor, working in New York, working on Wall Street, every weekend I would come home with every one of my trade confirms, lay them out on the living room floor, in Jersey City and go through every one of my trades and figure out what I did right and what I did wrong. That's the process. That's the homework that I had to put into it. All right. Now, um, excuse me. I'm sorry. Bear with me one second. I'm just checking my time. 427. Again, feel free to follow me on Instagram, which you guys are doing. Feel free to follow my posts and share it. Take a little sip of water. All right. Now, let me move on to a couple other things here. I talked about money flow coming in and out, and you can track that. You can track money flow. There's several websites that you can track it for free. Um, so I guess which so let me let me go through this right now. I use a number of different websites for my data. I use a number of different websites for my data. You don't have to use a number of different websites. Don't get me wrong. My trading platform provides everything that I go out and find on my own. The difference is, and some of you will understand this, I have a certain workflow that I've been doing for years, how I do things. Doesn't mean it make it right or wrong. It's just how I do things. And because of that, I go to several different websites for data. It just makes it easier for me because I go straight to that data. Now, who is it? Two places I, that you can get... Um, that you can get, I'm stuttering, I apologize, that I get the, uh, uh, cash, um, excuse me, money flow from. And one of the spots I get it from is Finviz. I'm on Finviz. Finviz is F-I-N-V-I-Z, Finviz. I'm on there right now. And they actually would give you the actual data and charts that will show you um, what industries are doing well and what money's flowing in and what money's flowing out. Also, what you can look at, too, is what, what I look at is performance. I look at the, the weekly and monthly performance for certain industries and sectors. Why is that important? Let's back up. Let's back up. Why do you need to look at sectors and money flow? All right. Follow me now. You're a professional portfolio manager. You have to be in the market. Got to be there. You're forecasting that we're going to go into a bearish market. Stocks are going to go down. Economy is going down. That's what you're forecasting. You have to be invested. Where are you going to invest your money? So money flow will show. So what am I saying? During bear markets, during recession, you'll see a lot of money flowing into what we call consumer staples and also utilities. So I'll go look at money flow and see 
What's going on? Where's money flowing to? If I see a lot of money flowing out of tech and flowing into utilities and flowing into consumer staples, it's telling me that these portfolio managers are forecasting or looking that they believe the economy is about to slow down. If I see money flowing into certain sectors, it tells me what these guys are think are going to happen going forward in the future. That's why I track money flow. I'm not tracking money flow um, for another reason, just to see where I want to be. It's easy to go with the tide than against the tide. So if money's flowing into these companies, if money's flowing into a certain industry, a certain sector, what it means is that there's more buyers and sellers. And because the money flow is going in, stock prices in that sector will go up. What I do then is, as I look at that sector, I'm going to go in there and find the top two or three performing stocks in that sector and look to trade those. All right. Again, everything I do is geared upon making money. Everything I do and say is not geared on me being right in terms of where the economy is going or where the stock's going. Everything I say and do is geared upon making me money. All right. That's what I look for in the marketplace. That's what I look for in terms of strategy. All right. So, all right. We got down money flow. We, sh we talked about money flow. Finviz is one place you can find it. Another place that another one I use is Bar Chart, B A R C H A R T, Bar Chart. They um, both for free. They do have subscription if you want to get subscription, but both for free. I use those. The other thing is I pull up my earnings and I, I look for companies with, and their earnings from Zax.com. So those are the sites I kind of frequent on a regular basis, looking, going through them and looking for trading ideas and also to see what sectors or what industries are hot. Now, what else can I tell you? The market, the, the, the market is, has warmed up. And one of the things that you're seeing now is that we're seeing IPOs start to come back to the marketplace. So you're seeing initial public offerings. Some of you know this, some of you don't, so I'll say it. For several years, I ran a hedge fund. And in my hedge fund, one of the things I did was I traded, heavily traded IPO stocks as well as secondary public offerings. So initial public offerings and secondary public offerings. Um, that's where I got my start in the business. That's why I put up my numbers. I started putting up my numbers before I expanded my research and, and my strategies. Now, when you look at the IPO market, it's pretty interesting. When companies go public, investment bankers bring them to the public. All right, your top investment banking firms, your Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, I know it's a bank, but the investment banking side, Citigroup, who else? So Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, these are all your top investment bankers. When the markets, well, well let me go with the other, say it another way. I can tell by the, the deals that are coming to the marketplace in terms of IPOs, what sectors or industries are hot. The companies that are coming public are the ones that the institutions have a demand for. So once the institutional investors have a demand for it, the investment bankers realize there's demand out in the marketplace for a certain sector or certain industry. And you're going to see a, a number of those companies come to come become a go public. So one of the things I look at to see what industries are hot, what industries are in favor, I look and see what industries are actually going public. And as you guys could probably guess, over the last two months, what industry has been the one that's gone public and the hottest in terms of going public? It's been the pharmaceuticals. It's been that, the biotech pharmaceuticals. All right. Um, there's several biotechs that have gone public in the last 30 days. One that comes to mind, and you guys will learn this with me. I'm bad with names. I'm great with symbols. Um, so I'm going to actually pull up this company if I can find the symbol. I know the symbol. Symbol ZNT. Stock's doubled. Or is it ZNL? I can't remember the symbol. Stock doubled. There are several, there are several, several technology stocks that have doubled. Excuse me, um, biopharmaceutical stocks that have doubled in the last 30 days are close to it. I'm looking, bear with me a second. I do apologize. I did have them up earlier. I'm looking for them now. Uh, I am not going, I don't chase stocks. <laughs> don't chase. But I'm looking now. Let's see, there's one. Two, 
What am I doing here? Oh, these are upcoming. Excuse me. I'm looking at the wrong looking at the wrong thing. IPOs priced. So I'm looking at IPOs priced. Sorry, I apologize. Looking at the wrong thing. IPOs priced. Let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven out of the last. Seven out of the last 11 IPOs going back to April 7th were pharmaceutical companies. And several of them have doubled in price or right, going up significantly. I'm looking now. One of them, what? Let's see. I got one here up 115%. One here up 124%. Another one here up 144%. I got one here up 176%. That's from the IPO price. All right. They're working, guys. So that's where money's flowing. You can always look and see where money's flowing. Check my time. All right. Boom, boom, boom. I got that. Now I'm looking to see. I'm just double checking. I don't see any questions. If you have any questions, I'm going to take a short break here just to hydrate a little bit, which is what I do. I'll check for stocks. Uh, excuse me, for questions. If not, I will ramble on. So we talked about the IP, we talked about money flow. We talked about earnings per share, which is location, location, location. Let me say a couple other things. <laughs> this is for my more advanced investors. I have every every weekend, I also I, oh, let me, I, I apologize. I did purchase two IPO stocks uh, last week. They both were trading at their all-time highs. They've gone higher. Um, the, the profits that we've gotten in are not much yet, but we'll see. I do believe that both stocks would give me an opportunity to make a 25, 30% return in the next week to two weeks if the market holds up. So that's what I did. Um, the other thing I do every weekend and I'll go into more detail as, as, as time comes, is I also, and I've said this before, I also invest in derivatives. So I do look at the commodities market. I look at, you know, as I said to you the other day, I trade everything, but I've never traded the cryptocurrencies. I have a hard time trading something I don't understand. And then, excuse me, believe it or not, I don't trade the cryptos. I also didn't do any of those, not that there's anything wrong with it. I didn't do any credit default swaps and the CMOs. That's not my area. So pretty much with me, you'll find stocks. I have traded some bonds, but really stocks and um, futures, Forex. I will trade those. All right. So as I was saying over the weekend, I go through, I do some research. I do both fundamental and technical analysis. Uh, okay. And I do fundamental technical analysis. And I come up with my list for the week of what commodities I'm interested in trading. Now, the reason why I tell you this is that I'm kind of a, 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 a unique in this respect. I combine both fundamental and technical analysis. So when I go look at commodities, when I look at corn, soybean, um, I'm trying to think what I've been what I've been looking at corn soybean so, several other currencies um, I look at it from a fundamental standpoint as well as a technical standpoint so fundamental is easy what do we have going on now fundamentally fundamentally China was supposedly had stopped buying soybeans and corn from us Fun, that's the fundamentals but fundamentally they actually brought three cargo ships of soybeans, and that's why soybeans were up yesterday. I didn't see them look today, but soybeans were up. Those are the fundamentals. The technicals are nothing more than price, volume, and open interest. So I look at those also. Um, let's see here. <sighs> All right. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just reading the question out here. That I have and I'll get back to it. I promise I'll come back to it. All right. So that's what I do. Um, I do trade the currencies. I do trade um, the, like I said, I do trade the currencies. I trade the straight futures or the options on the futures. I don't trade the pairings. 
So that's what I do. And again, I combine technical and fundamental. I am working on right now a PowerPoint presentation that I will put onto my YouTube page, which is basically talks about fundamental analysis versus technical analysis. I do both. I use both and then how to use them. So that I would, I hopefully will have that finished by the weekend and have that up for you guys. Now I had a question concerning taxes. So <laughs> I'm smiling because one of the things I used to always say is I have a tax problem. It's always good to have a tax problem as an investor. If you have a tax problem, that means that you're making money. If you don't have a tax problem, it means either that you're not making money or that you lost a whole bunch of money. You got these losses that you can carry around with you. So two things. One, if you're short term trading stock, you're generating either short term capital gains or short term capital losses. If you're generating short term capital gains, those gains will be taxed as ordinary income in the year received. Let me say it again. If you're trading stock and you have a capital gain, you sold the stock for more than you paid for it, and you held the stock for less than one year, you have um, your, your, that, that gain is going to be taxed at, as ordinary income, which means it's going to be taxed at whatever marginal tax bracket you're in. So if you're in a 25% tax bracket and you got a 10% profit short term in your trading account, $2,500 is going out to Uncle Sam. All right. Um, let's see what else. Now, if you hold that security for one year and a day or longer, long term capital gain. Let me say it again. If you hold that security for one year and a day. All right. You have a exclusion. You only pay taxes on 30% of the gain. So let's break this down. You make $10,000 in your trading account, but it was on a security that you held for longer than one year. You sold it. All right, first and foremost, you sold it, you made $10,000. $7,000 is excluded um, from taxes. $7,000 is gone. You don't have to pay tax on that. It's yours. You have to pay tax on the $3,000, but you only have to pay 25% of the $3,000. So in this case, instead of you paying $2,500, you're paying 750 bucks, all because you now have a long-term capital gain. So repeat this. Anytime that you can take your gains and turn them from long-term, excuse me, from short-term into long-term, then take the long-term, if you can, take the long-term profit because you'll have a much better tax consequence. Now, that guys, I'm not telling you not to, I'm not telling you not to um, um, hold this. I'm not telling you to hold a stock that might go down in value or that you, that you don't want to own anymore just for the tax benefits. I'm saying that if you're right around a full year and you haven't sold it and, you, and things are going well, hold it for at least a year before you sell it for the tax benefits. Now your capital losses, you buy an asset, sell it for less than you pay, sell it for less than you paid for it. That's a capital loss. Doesn't matter whether it's long term or short term. You can use those to offset your capital gains, your long term capital gains. You can net it out. But again, there's no, there's the only tax. You only can use that gain to offset other gains. If you're trading derivatives, derivatives have a whole different tax structure. Derivatives have a much better tax structure in terms have a much better tax structure in terms of short term versus long term gains. I am not up on all those. My accountant is. I'm not. So again, if you're trading derivatives with a profit like that, I highly recommend that you make sure that you hire an accountant that understands derivatives or have the accountant look up with the IRS and do his research to make sure they understand the tax consequences of derivatives. There are certain tax benefits to derivatives, and the See, I, I just don't know. Short term, excuse me, long term is not a year. It's less than a year. And it's, and it's part of your gains and derivatives is not is fully taxable. So again, I, I don't know those rules. But again, make sure that you check with your accountant before. So that, I guess, I, hopefully I answered your question on taxes. Um, that's what someone was asking me. Now, what is this? Um, the question, so I'll read the question to you. 
Somebody said I think it'd be more um think it'd be more on the retail pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals means development of drugs. All right. I'm talking about the biotech pharmaceuticals, the ones that develop drugs. They are the ones that um have been going public. Not all of them are working on the coronavirus, so don't don't even think that. But they but there seems to be a huge demand for these type of products right now in terms of IPO and they're going public. And if you know anything about biotech pharmaceuticals, most of them, in fact, almost all of them, have no revenue or no earnings because they're actually in the developmental stage. But again, over the last, in fact, before, before we had our lockdown, before coronavirus, I'm thinking now that there was a, a biotech that went public that Bill Gates and his, uh, Bill Gates's trust is a major shareholder in that. And that one was a 40, 50% return on that IPO. Um, in fact, I think right now, in fact, I know right now the stock is trading at all time high. So you're seeing that move in that sector. So to, to wrap that up, I'm gonna say it to you again, you wanna check what sectors you're in. You wanna check and, wait and see you, what sectors are hot, where money's flowing. Um, all right, so let me see what else here. Um, I don't see any other question. I think I got all my questions going forward. So, um, let me check my time real quick. Take a quick sip of water while I check my time. Give me a second. All right. So in these last 15 minutes, last 15 minutes or so, less than 15 minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to, let me, let me do this. One of the things that, so <laughs> I'm going to give up more, I'm going to give more of my philosophy, my strategy than I was planning on this call, but I'll give up more of my strategy. And on one of my strategies, and students have heard me say this, I do not believe in trying to bottom fish. I do not believe in trying to buy stocks that are that we're forecasting now, again don't get me wrong here i'm talking about me so before i even go into me let me just say this and, and i've said this a number of times i could bring 15 successful investors into this room right now and they'll and they'll have 15 distinctly different strategies so there is no one way to make money in the market there is no one way that always works in the marketplace either. So I have several strategies that work for me and my temperament. What works for me and my temperament might not work for you and your temperament. I'll share them with you. You'll understand what I, why I do what I do, but it doesn't mean that it's gonna work for you. The biggest challenge that you're gonna have going forward right now is figuring out what and who you are in terms of an investor. So who am I in terms of investor? I'm a growth investor. I like growth stocks. I like growth investments. I like to know that when I put my trade on, my investment on, that my reward, reward could be two to one, at least two to one. In other words, I'm willing to invest a dollar to make two dollars. All right, so that's what I'm saying. Doesn't mean that you have to think that way I think. One of the things I just was talking about was, as you know, Warren Buffett does not buy, didn't, was not a, a tech stock buyer. Warren Buffett's portfolio did not average 20% for the last 30 years. All right. So with all that said, my my go to strategy, the one that I typically can do in almost any market environment is based on fundamentals and technicals. And it's a breakout. So what do I mean by that? Typically, what you'll find from Professor Milligan is one. When I buy a stock is typically at or within 10 percent probably even close to that, of its all-time high. That's right. I do not buy stocks that are down in price or stocks that are trading near their lows or so forth. I only buy up stocks. You know, one of the things which I posted on Instagram is the deer get dear and the cheap get cheaper. I only buy up stock. Short answer to that is why? Because I think they're going to continue to go higher. <laughs> That's the simple reason. 
And why do I not buy stocks that are going down? Because our contention is that they're probably going to continue to go down. And when they, when they, when they, and if they're going down, when they fix themselves or fix the problem, and the stock starts to go back up, I'll buy it then. But I have no desire to buy a stock today that's going to take another two, three, four years for them to figure out what's wrong and, and make it work before it goes higher. So the first place I start to, to look for my trades is, believe it or not, is I go to the 52-week high. I look at the 52-week high every day. I want to see what stocks, what industries, what stocks, what companies are going higher. And then from there, I'll go do some checking. Is it going high because of a merger acquisition? Is it going high because of product demand? Why is it going higher? And then once I figure out why it's going higher, that's probably going to be one of the companies I look at. So I put a buy recommendation on Zoom at 150. Gosh, I can look at my look at my research, but I put a buy on Zoom, Zoom video technologies at 150. I want to say the first week of the pandemic, so they had to be what, uh, February, I guess. I got it. I'll go look it up. But I put a buy on at 150. Was it a volatile ride? Yeah, it's been a volatile ride. And the stock right now is at 220. All right. So the deer get deer, the cheap get cheaper. I only buy up stock. So that's my first rule on this strategy. Two, I never take a loss bigger than 10%. I don't take losses. I don't take big losses. Now, the 10% rule is based on where I purchase it. So if I buy a stock at 100 bucks and it goes to 85, I'm gone. If I buy a stock at 100 bucks, it goes to $90, I'm gone probably. If the stock stays above 90, I'll, I'll stay with it. But I don't take big losses. And if I take a big loss, excuse me, not take a big loss. If the stock, so, so let me back up. I don't take big losses. Typically when I say that, students say, well, Professor Milligan, you know, you could be wrong. You know, you could sell it and it could go back higher. Yeah, that's true. And when it does, I'll buy it then. But what about if it doesn't go higher? What about that 10% loss turns into a 20% loss? And it turns into a 30% loss. On its way down to a 50% loss. And you're sitting there holding that stock. And I'm telling you from experience. I'm not, I'm not preaching to you. I'm telling you from my experience. When you have a big loser in your portfolio, it takes all of your concentration, all your focus is on that big loser. And you're spending more time with your loser worrying about that one and watching that one than you are with your winners. Get it out of your portfolio. Cut them off your team. Get rid of them. Trade them. Raise capital, all right? Raise, raise money, sell it. But again, what I'm saying to you is do not take big losses. Big losses take even longer time to recoup the loss to get back to break even. There's another piece on, on my Instagram page that shows if you have a 10% loss, you need 11% return to get back to break even. A 20% loss, you need a 25% return to break even. A 50% loss means you need a 100% move from the stock back up to where it was to break even. We're not even talking about making any money. And how many stocks do you know that, that double in price in a short period of time? So avoid big losses. As a portfolio manager, as an investor, just wipe them out, your, especially with your, your initial investment. Because that's your principal, that's your money. I apologize, I gotta check my time, I, you know, I, I get excited. Protect your principal, that's the most important thing. So, one, I buy stocks near at the all-time high. Two, when I do buy that stock, I, I, I will not take more than a 10% loss. When I buy that stock, what's my signal to buy that stock? Typically, I wanna see twice the average daily volume. It's just that simple. I need to see sponsorship. One of the conversations I had with one of my former students, really, really bright guy, really bright guy. I probably should say, probably smarter than me. And we were having this conversation about investing and trading, whether it be long-term or short-term. And one of the things that, that I keep saying and he keeps saying, which is what we say, is that no matter what you do, make sure, make sure that you, that you manage your portfolio for losses, for risk, 
all right? How much are you gonna have if you're wrong? How much will you lose if you're wrong? Manage your portfolio that way, because you're gonna be right, but manage it based upon your wrong. So let me go over again. My first strategy, one, all-time high. Two, within 10% of the all-time high. When I finally decide that I'm gonna buy it, it must have broken out or traded high on twice the average daily value. If I'm wrong, I'm gonna cut my losses. Now my screening criteria for this, I am looking at stocks and companies that have it, it have double digit growth in revenue and double and definitely double digit growth in earnings per share. I mean that that th those are the companies I'm looking at. So you can kind of see what suspects those are. But again, repeat, my goal is to make money. I'm buying a stock at 10 cuz I think it goes to 40, not cuz it goes to $10 or to $11. I'm buying a stock at 100 cuz I think it goes to 300. And I'm not talking about over the next 20 years either. So one of the things that as we go forward, you'll hear me talk about this, um, the things that are going to drive value. Now, one last thing. <laughs> uh, again, I'm checking my time. All right, cool. I got four minutes. Of course, was it the best for last? These great companies. Well, I'm not going to say great companies. These stocks and these companies tend to travel in packs. Let me say it again. These stocks, these companies, these industries, these sectors travel in packs. So when the sector is hot, the whole sector becomes hot. When a sector is cold, the whole sector becomes cold. But when a sector is hot, I don't want the worst company in the sector. I still want the best company in the, in the best sectors. I hope that's making sense. So if I'm going to go out there and buy a footwear company, I'm not going out there and buy, no offense to anybody when I say this, because I know my son loves Vans. But I'm not buying Vans. I'm buying Nike. It's the best company. I'm not buying Under Armour. I'm buying Nike. If I'm going to go out there and, and, and buy a semiconductor company, a semi that makes semiconductor chips, I'm not saying I am. I said if. I'm looking at NVIDIA. I'm looking at Intel. I'm looking at the best of the best. I want the best company in the hottest industries. That's how I'm going to make my money. All right. Um, so with that said, I'm going to wrap it up for today. Before I go, I do appreciate all of you coming. Please keep sharing with me your stories, your successes, your failures, where you're making money, where you're not making money. I promise you I'll go through it. I, I've been at this for years now. I've got a number of different strategies, like I said, for the stock market, for the commodities market. I will post this on YouTube. Uh, so again, go to YouTube, YouTube, uh, Professor Milligan, and you'll find me and, and, and my channel. I am in the process now of creating some videos for you guys. These videos will be got, that you can look at that actually will give you visual examples of what I'm showing you, what I, what I look at which I can't do now, but I will put that together for you guys. All right, and again, if you have anything specific you wanna ask me, because I know I get a lot of questions during the week, um, which I don't mind answering, but again, I would love to answer some of those questions online with everyone else because some people have the exact same question they just didn't answer, or they, it could help them. So again, if you have any questions, direct message me before I go online and I'll do my best to answer them. And if you don't have any direct messages, then I'll just come on and I'll start talking more and more about my philosophy and what I'm doing to make money. Oh, before I go also, I'm looking at this Warner, Warner Music Group, WMG. They were, they were public, then they went private. Now they're back public. I think that um, I, I'm looking at it. So I got to watch it, look at it, do some research on it. But again, those who've been around me know that that's my area. That's where I came from. I came from the IPO market, so I have no problem looking at that. All right. With that said, have a blessed, blessed, stay safe, stay safe, um, have a blessed week, stay safe, and um, stay healthy. Thanks a lot. I will talk to you later. Bye-bye. I guess I should sit here and just smile. I'm going to sit here and smile. <laughs> I know, I do really silly. All right, have a blessed one, guys.